And we are, we are sharing faith and money, looking at what the Bible says about the, this topic that is one of the two most controversial, argued about subjects that, uh, that are in the Word of God, the other being sex. Uh, that's what people fight about. And uh, people looked at me this morning. They said, why are you wearing a suit? And I said, the NFL season is kicking off. So I came dressed as a sportscaster. I got the shoes. I got the whole thing, you know, just looking forward to the Broncos being better than whatever they were last year in Jesus' name. So got to have faith. But uh, I'm glad you're here. I encourage you to get out pieces of paper, your phone, whatever, to be able to take notes, take, take takeaways away so that you can actually put this word to use. And this is, if you're a first-time visitor or you have been gone for a few weeks, we're in week two of a series on faith and money. And the subject that we're going to talk about this week is what is your plan? What is your plan? Your personal plan. And just to review a little bit about what we covered last week, we, we talked about the fact that you literally have to ignore whole sections of the Bible to believe that God does not want you to live a blessed life. I mean, you have to, it's, it's explicit in the Old Testament. It is implicit in the New Testament. You have to, to ignore God's character and, and how he treated the children of Israel for thousands of years to believe that God does not have a desire to be a generous father and bless his children. It is equally true that you have to ignore whole sections of the Bible and much of Jesus' teaching if you think that God wants to empower your dysfunctional behaviors. He does not want to help you to be stupid. He does not want to help you to be crazy. He does not want to give you the resources to go out and be nuts. And, and so, so what we have to do is realize that God always has a blessing with a purpose, but he never, wants he never wants finances to become an idol in our life, a focus of our worship, a focus of our attention. He can't serve two masters. We talked about the fact that we live in a culture that, that has so many things that, that are contrary to the teachings and the scriptures, but perhaps the most toxic is our, our society's infatuation with materialism, with stuff, with, with looking a certain way, with, with living a certain way, with, you know, just a pursuit of, 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 of pointless things that, that, that we make a priority in our life. We've got our minds whacked out. I was thinking about this sermon, and I was remembering a conversation I had many years ago with a, a gentleman who was a professional in his mid-30s. And you know, he sat down with me, and he said, I just got to tell you that you know, my life's awful. I, 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 I have a you know, horrible, I'm broke. I, I've got a horrible job. I live in a horrible house. And so I just began to ask some questions. And, and again, this, this, is, this is a few years ago. I said, well, how, how much, you know, he was married, how much do you and your wife bring in? You know, I, I know you're struggling, but you know, you're professional, so I was a little surprised. He said, we make $150,000 a year. I said, oh, that's, that's terrible. Uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just sitting there going like, oh, well, again, this was 15 years ago. And, and, and I go, okay, well, uh, where, where is the shack that you're living in? I, I didn't say that. I was more generous. And, and, he's, and he told me that the suburb, it's in the southern part. And, 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 it's, and he goes, yeah, it's just 1,800 square feet with three bedrooms and two and a half baths and a two-car garage. Wow, that's desperate living there right there, I got to tell you. And, and we had a con candid conversation. And I said, if you look at your life and you see yourself as poor, something is inherently wrong because you're not poor. You're not even close to not poor. You're blessed. You're thriving. You're prosperous. Now, you've got some issues but money isn't the problem. And that's the last time I saw him because he didn't want to hear that because in his mind, he was convinced that he was inadequate. That's the poison nature of materialism. And we talked about how our lifestyle should reflect different priorities than non-Christians. So, I mean, we literally should live a different set of, set of rules is wrong, but just... How we want to live our life should look differently than other people's. You know, generosity isn't an option if you claim to be a follower of Christ. You can't say, I follow Jesus and not be generous. And if you want a kind of an enlightened self-interest reason to do that, consider Proverbs 19.17. If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. That's a good verse. You know, it's interesting that uh, I was, as I was studying for this, I ran across this quote from... Um, from the last pagan Roman Empire emperor. Now, 
You guys have heard of, of, of Constantine, right? The emperor who, who moved the Roman Empire to, to Christianity, made it, made it the official you know, religion of Rome. Well, after he died, there was like a revolution to see who would take over. And his nephew won. And his nephew is remembered in history by the moniker Julian the Apostate. That's a great name to inherit. Hi, what, who are you? I'm Julian the Apostate, not Julian the Righteous, not Julian the Blessed. I'm Julian the Apostate. And he had the, he, he had, he had the distinction of being the last pagan Roman empire, emperor. And there was a famine in the land, and Julian w- was mad at the pagan priests because one of the reasons why the Roman Empire was converting to Christianity was because they saw the, the, the humanitarian outreach, the compassion of the early Christian church and how they, they took care of people. And historically, they actually found this letter from Julian the Apostate to the head of the pagan priests in Rome at the time. And it says this, that the poor were neglected and overlooked by the pagan priests. Then the Christians observed this fact and devoted themselves to philanthropy. They support not only their poor, but ours as well. And all men see that our people lack aid from us. We showed up. We showed off. We told them that God loved them. We don't ask anything from you. We just care about you. We're willing to help you. And the church in this, in this neo-pagan period that we've entered into must remember the importance of generosity and compassion. So with that review in hand, though, I, I want us to get into, into the next part of this, this series. And I began with this question, or statement, I should say. Wherever God puts you, whatever career you pursue, he can prosper you and cause you to grow in your influence, but you will need a plan. In my life, I have personally known a janitor who worked for the Missouri State Highway Department who owned 32 rental properties. He came to work in a Mercedes. He put on a a jumpsuit and went and cleaned toilets all day. I I asked him one time, why are you still working as a janitor? And he said, I get a pension in two more years. (laughs) But the man never made more than probably the equivalent of 15 bucks an hour. I have known a cleaning lady without a high school diploma who makes $250,000 a year. No education to speak of, no, no great talent, but she got, a, she got a thought from God. I've known a man who got laid off of a $100,000 a year job. He was, he was a project manager. He got laid off, fired, and not because of anything he did, but the company was, was going through a difficult time. He lost a $100,000 a year job. And in the next 12 months, he tripled his income while still being unemployed because he got a God idea. There is literally nothing that disqualifies you from having a plan that will lead you from where you are to someplace better financially. Unless you're already super blessed, and that's fine. But a lot of us are still trying to figure out how we can pay the rent, pay the mortgage, take care of the credit card bills, keep the kids in school. And, and, and that's what I want to emphasize. I meet people all the time who say, I've got this dream. I want to do this, and I want that. I want blah, 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 blah. And when I hear people say, I have a dream, my next question is, do you have a plan? Now, if they say, yes, I say, great. That's wonderful. But if your plan isn't working, could I suggest you look for a different one? I mean, it's after a while, you just ask that question. And, and, and a plan that's based on the truth that's in the Word of God and that flows from the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because I guarantee you, God did not forget about you. You're not excluded from his promises. You're not excluded from his blessings. You haven't disqualified yourself. And to encourage you, I want us to watch the story of one of our fellow encounter members. This is the story of a, of a, a friend of mine, uh, Hubert. And I want you to see what can result in the life of a family, the finances of a family, from one God idea. 
Hi there, there Encounter Fam. I'm here with my good, good friend, friend, Hubert Aguirre, yes. and uh, good, good to have, have you. And uh, he is the owner and operator of Front Range Landscaping, which is one of the premier Denver uh, nurseries and landscape uh, companies. You do trees, you do the trees in my HOA, yes. which is, is, they're still alive, which is wonderful. And so uh, Encounter, he's also been a great blessing to the church. He's helped us with some of the, the landscaping here on the property. I think it looks great in large part because of many of the contributions that you generously so on. But, but the reason I'm asking him to sit and kind of talk with us is I want you to hear his story of, of his family, their journey, and how they really got to this place where we got us kind of opened up new opportunities for you and blessed you in really a number of different ways. I mean, you've got your, you don't need to go over them all, but you've got your fingers in a number of different pies. So let's go back. Your family homesteaded in Colorado mid 1800s? Yeah, mid 1800s. Southern Colorado? Southern Colorado uh, were farmers and ranchers. There is a pinion trees. A pinion tree yeah, is, sure. is is a highly sought after tree. And what they would do is, at that time, the mines um, were going broke because Walsenburg, yeah, Wilkesbury yeah. County, is is a mining town. So you get these miners. They would physically dig these trees up by hand, put them on trucks, and they'd bring them to the tree nurseries here and um, uh, and wholesale them out. And wholesale. So they would, was wholesale. they would go harvest trees from yes. the wild. Mm -hmm. and sell them wholesale to, to nurseries here in, in Denver. Exactly. Became a family business. And yes, you, that's right. your family were, were Christian, very strong Christian. Oh, yeah. And so generational blessing raised in the church. Oh, yeah. And, and so you be, became sort of the wholesale end of the tree business. You got an idea of, of, of how you could expand the family business. Yes. When, I was, when I was about 18, 19 years old, there was this one gentleman that would come up to Franktown, Castle Rock area. Sure. And he would buy 12 or 14 big, you know, ponderosa pines, and he would, and, and this gentleman would bring them up to, you know, areas here in the Denver area, and he was selling them off the truck. This gentleman comes back, and he's got a pocket full of money, and he's asking me where his trees are, and um, I said, you know, I think that um, I think that um, I don't have your trees for you today. <laughs> he was very, very upset. I imagine he was. And so where were his trees, Hubert? They were on my trailer. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> he inspired you. Yes. Because if he can do it, you can do it. And now, how did your dad respond when you pitched him this idea? He did not like it. Now, why, why didn't he Be, like it? He was afraid else? I was going to upset the other nurseries. Sure. You know, um, things of that sort. And I just said, I'm going to be up. I'm going to be up at four in the morning like I always am. And I'm going north. Do you still have the wholesale operation down in there? Down in, just kind of let that, that has actually kind of faded. Yes, there is other folks that do that down there um, in the, the Workville County area, and now we buy from them. And that's good because that is an area that desperately needs business. And so it's, it, 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 unfortunately, it's a very depressed area. And that's your, that's where your family grew up. That, exactly. And you're able to employ a number yeah. of people. Sure. And, and provide good jobs sure. to people, but not, but also give opportunities to people who are needing that that first position. You know, the, the, a lot of first generation people that are that are here that are looking for a chance to, to set down some roots to have the opportunities that, that you've had. That's a big deal to you because I, I, we and I have talked. Your heart is to help move people forward. Definitely, you don't want if, look. We weren't poor, but we weren't affluent either. Exactly. But we got one idea which was to change our business yeah, just a little bit, just to go from the wholesale to the retail side, to sell trees for 500 rather than 100. Right, exactly. You, you know, because there's a difference there, and why couldn't that be in your pocket? Exactly. But it was one God idea that began with being willing to get up at 4.30 in the morning to drive, how far is it from Walsenburg to here? Uh, 160 miles. So you drove 160 miles, was that every day? Yeah. Every day? Sometimes twice. Sometimes twice to sell trees on the side of the road from a flatbed. Yes, exactly. It takes a <laughs> okay. lot of hard work, but All if right. you but if you ask God for guidance, yeah. like I do every day, and you have ask God for vision, yeah. you ask God for everything that you would like, you could go to that next level. And you you would give glory to God for the success you've seen. Yes, definitely. God idea that I, you, you get on you get in what a friend of mine called the God flow, and then you 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 work like it really is a God idea. One piece of advice to somebody saying, Lord, give me a God idea, because I want to go to the next level. I want to break out. What would that one piece of advice be? It would be, don't be afraid to take a risk and work hard. All right. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. God bless. And 
For those of you watching, remember that advice. God has big things for you if you're willing to take a risk, if you're willing to work hard, and if you're willing to pray. I love Hubert. I love his story. I love the, the, the encouragement it is to all of us and the impact that it's made on his family and his extended family and into the, the community that he came from. I mean, this is what God wants to do. He wants to do things in us that, that have influence and that, that don't just, you know, give us a yacht so we can cruise around the Caribbean and have everybody look at us and say, ooh, you look cool. And I'm not against yachts, but, but, but to, to literally change the lives of not only our families, but the people we touch. So the people come to an understanding that God is real and he loves them and he cares for them and he solves real problems. You know, from Hubert's uh, testimony, there were three things that, that, that I'm going to be speaking on today. And, and the first is the importance of praying and asking for guidance and vision. Uh, you know, that, that you, can't, you cannot follow God if you don't talk to God. <laughs> Uh, the, the need to, to not be afraid to take risks. And, and this whole concept of hard work. Have you noticed that hard work has gotten a bad name and a bad rep lately? Uh, I mean, it, it, there seems to be this thing that, that you're not really cool unless you're not working. And, and that, uh, I, I don't understand that. I, where, I mean, you know, you get 24 hours in a day, 365 days in a year. And, and so do we really need to spend the majority of our time, you know, disconnecting and being entertained? And I like entertainment, but, but it seems like God has a higher purpose and a call for our time and our efforts. And, and, and so I, I want to begin to talk, first of all, about, about hard work. There's something I believe to the core of my soul, and I think it's supported by Scripture, and, and, and it's this. Anything you don't work for, you will never value. Anything that you work for, anything, anything that somebody gives you, you will never value it because you'll never appreciate it. That's, what, that's why so many Christians in my mind receive Jesus as their Savior, but it doesn't make the transformation in their life that it could because they don't know what God just did for them. Do you know what God just did for you? He changed your eternity, and he can change your present. And you're like, oh, that's no big deal. <laughs> I'm like, it's a big deal. I mean, we know this with kids. Uh, there was a, a family years ago, and, and a church member... It, reached out and they were just going through a hard time and they decided this is back when Cadillacs were cool. You guys remember when Cadillacs were cool? It's a long time ago, but it did actually exist. And they bought them a Cadillac and gave it to them. And it was a wonderful car. But within three months, the car was dirty. You know, the doors were dinged. The bumpers were dented. You know, they didn't do the maintenance on it. And so, hey, you know, you got to do oil changes. Yeah, you got to do oil changes. And so they took this beautiful gift and, and, and it just became this, this hoopty mobile, even though it was a Cadillac, because they didn't appreciate what it was they had been given. I love what uh, St. Augustine said in, to the early church. He said this. He said, pray as though everything depended upon God. Work as though everything depended upon you. <laughs> and that's great advice. Now, if you're a sports fan like I am, there's a famous British cricket player by the name of Tim Notke. And Tim Kotke is, is quoted often. He, he said this. He said, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. You get that? I, I mean, the NFL starts Thursday night, and you're going to see a lot of guys who are excelling in the NFL who may not be the most talented, but they put in the time. They put in the effort. And, and that's the thing that, that we, we think that, oh, I, I don't need to work hard because I'm talented. And yet that's not true. Proverbs 13.4 famously says that lazy people want much, but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. Hard work is a good thing. But you want to work hard on the right things. Now, you can, you can, has anybody ever known somebody that was not lazy, but they just devoted themselves to stupid and pointless pursuits? Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, no, they're not really lazy. They're just not doing anything that helps the family. They're, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I better not say that because they might see this. Uh, somebody else had a friend one time <laughs> who, who really loved hunting and fishing and all that other stuff. And, and this is pre-YouTube and pre-before you could make money at this stuff, okay? So, so you know, his, he was the hardest working hunter fisherman I ever met in my life. The problem was he had a job with the gas company. And so his family struggled because he wasn't lazy. He just worked at the wrong things. 
Proverbs got some really great wisdom about what it is you should make as a priority in Proverbs 13, 7. There are some who are poor but pretend to be rich. There are others who are rich but pretend to be poor. That, that there is this reality that folks want to get the, the... They want people to think they're wealthy. So they buy the watch or they buy the ring or they buy the car or they buy the suit. You, you know, I am wearing a suit today, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it came from Macy's, so give me a break. <laughs> so so the, 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 the point of this is that, that, that there are people who want others to think that, that's, that they're important because of what they wear, and it's got nothing to do with importance. You've got to have right priorities. I love Proverbs 24, 27. Do your planning and prepare your fields before you build your house. What's that talking about? Have you ever wanted to have a big, fancy house? I used to. There was a time in my life I said, I want a big, fancy house. And then I realized, do you know how much work a big, fancy house is? If I can't get a maid and a cleaning person and a lawn service and a repair guy, I don't want no mansion. That's just more work for me. Come on now, get an amen in this house. You know, that, that's a money sink. <laughs> I had a friend of mine, they sold it. They, sold, they had a house up in the mountains, and, and, and he finally sold it. And he was, so, I'm so grateful. I said, why? He goes, we put a half a million dollars a year in that house just keeping it up. I'm like, shoot, I'll go live in there and take care of it for you. You should have just called, you know. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, but, but the point of it is, though, those things don't generate money, but your feels do, whatever your feels are. You know, I love Proverbs, you know, 14, verse 4. It says, without oxen, a stable stays clean. Do you know what that means? It means there's no poop. I mean, if you ain't got no oxen in your, in your barn, you got no poop to deal with. Because if you got an oxen in the barn, you got to deal with the oxen's poop. But you need a strong ox for a large harvest, which means you need a lot of poop. If you're going to have a big harvest, you're going to have to deal with a lot of poop. And I was, I was reading that, and I was, I was remembering a story that, that's often told. I think it's an anecdote that's happened over and over again uh, of this person who visits a stockyard. You guys know what a stockyard is, an animal pen? Visits it for the first time, and they get out of their car, and they, they go around, they go, what, what is that smell? Because stockyards stink. Anybody ever been to one? They stink. Stockyards stink. And, and this person goes, what's that, a horrible odor? And this older rancher leans over and says, honey, that's not a horrible odor. That's the, that's the smell of money. That's what that is. That's the smell of money right there. That's what money smells like. It may be offensive to you, but it spins good. You know what I'm saying? And so we've got to remember to work hard, but we've got to remember to work hard at the right things. We want to own things that appreciate and generate, generate income later. We, we, we just... Let me just ask, how many of you, you know, you, you follow sports and you hear about these signing bonuses that basketball and baseball players and football players, you know, so-and-so got a $5 million bonus and so-and-so got a, I mean, what did Russell get? hundred, he got a $50 million signing bonus. I mean, oh, to be Russell's friend. Anyway, but, 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 but just consider this. If you got a $5 million bonus, you could go out and buy a $5 million house. And you don't own a $5 million house. That's a beautiful house. But what if you went out and bought a $1 million house and then went out and bought four $1 million houses to go with it that were rental properties? You still bought $5 million in real estate, but you now have real estate that generates money. And you're not living in quite as nice a home, probably not nearly as nice a home, but it's a million-dollar home. It's not a dump. And you got money working for you. Work hard at the right things. Second thing that, that Hubert talked about, he said, don't be afraid to take a risk. I just want to prick your thought with this concept. Which is riskier, following your plans or God's? Do, 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 do. Then why do we fight against God so much? Well, we, we read in the Word, and the Holy Spirit comes in, and he says, hey, I'd like you to do that, and I'd like you to do it this way. Oh, I mean, I can't do that. That's too risky. And I'm thinking, compared to what? Why is it that anything that we read in the Word, we tend to dismiss as being, that's radical, man. That's radical. That's radical living. You know, my neighbor doesn't live that way. The guy down the street doesn't live that way. Nobody at work lives that way. Yeah. But which is riskier, following your plan 
are following God's. To encourage you again, I, I, I love, love Psalm 32, 8. This is something you could confess over your life every single day, and it would not be a waste of time. And it is this. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. He's got a pathway for your life, a specific plan for your life. And he will guide you along the best pathway for your life. And I will advise you and watch over you. You know, my parents passed many years ago, and I, and I miss them because in part they were two of the people I went to for advice. Um, they weren't particularly spiritual people, but they had tremendous common sense. And, and I would call my father. I remember one time being mad because I hadn't got a promotion. I was just livid, and I was going to quit my job, and I was going to go there and tell them people they didn't appreciate the best thing that ever happened to them, which, which was me walking in the door. And I was better than 90% of their other deadbeat employees, and if they didn't appreciate me enough to, to give me the raise that I was due and the promotion that I was due, by God, I was going to go down there and straighten them out. So I called my dad, and, and he just said, boy, calm down. Calm down. I'm telling you, don't do something you're going to regret. Don't do something you're going to regret. I'm going to tell you a story. And he told me how he had gotten mad at a, at a company that he'd worked for as a young man and walked off and quit. And he said, had I stayed, I'd have been vice president of engineering, I think. But I was, and they, in fact, they called me. I was mad at my boss. And they called me up later and said, would you come back and we'll make you your boss's boss? And I was too prideful and said, no, I've made my decision. I've moved on. You need somebody to watch over you, to guide you. And the Holy Spirit can do that. He'll use the Word of God. He'll use people. People still say, well, it's risky out there. I remember one time, this guy came in. He said, I was following God, and the wheels fell off of my business. And I said, I know the wheels fell off your business, but that's because you're a liar and a cheat. Because <laughs> he was cooking the books. And that's not the devil. The devil attacked my business. No, you are a liar and a cheat. That creates risk, let me tell you. It wasn't the plan that was the problem. It's how you implemented it. Because integrity will reduce your risk. Hey, just, just, how, have you ever thought how the world defines integrity? The world defines integrity this way. Is it legal? Is it legal? Is it legal? If it's legal, it must be right. It must be good. I, I followed the rules. I did, I did what the law required. Wonderful. That's great. Does that make it right? No, especially if you're not a Christian. Do you know how God defines integrity? Do to others as you would like them to do to you. Now, that's way more comprehensive and, frankly, goes to the heart of a lot of issues that may be legal, but they're not right. God calls us to be honest with our employees and our customers. I was 16 years old, the first time a company ripped me off. I was working for a franchisee of Wendy's, and I was working 48 hours a week. It was in the summer. I loved working. I was working all these hours. I liked the money. I had nothing else going on. And, and, and they, they didn't pay me overtime. In fact, they took me aside and they said, hey, look, we can't pay you overtime because we don't pay overtime. So, so you're not getting overtime on those extra eight hours. And I didn't care. I thought, that's fine. I just want to get paid. I was, I don't know, probably 22 till before I realized that, hey, they stole money out of my pocket, a whole $8 a week. <laughs> that's literally, they were, I mean, because I was making $2.85 an hour. So what I didn't get was the extra dollar forty whatever that works out, times eight. I guess it's $12 a week. Who steals $12 from a 16-year-old? What kind of person runs their business that way? I hope it's not us. You know what I'm saying? Because that's risky. And if you look at what happened to that franchisee in the future, you'll understand that's a bad way to run your business. We shouldn't be doing that. You want to get on God's bad side? Go exploit the weak and the vulnerable. We're going to take advantage of them. Why? Because we can. And they can't do anything about it. You want to get on by God's bad side? You want a risky lifestyle? Try to live in that way and see what happens, particularly if you claim to be a follower of Christ. How about treating the, the rich and poor the same? Should you take advantage of somebody just because they have money? Should you cheat them just because you can? Years ago, I, I mean like 1998, I had a friend who lived over near Cherry Hills, and, and he was in an affluent community, and he wanted to build a deck on his house. 
And he, but he, he lived there, and he, he was a lawyer and very successful, but he grew up blue collar. So he called up a contractor. He said, hey, I'd like to put a deck on the backside of my house. Contractor said, well, show me the plans, and they got together. He said, that'll be $75,000. My buddy looked at him and said, I'm not asking for an extension on a house. I just want a deck. How could you possibly charge me $75,000? He said, I think if you check with your neighbors, that's the going price out here. It's $75,000. I mean, decks cost that much here in this neighborhood. And so he called his dad up. Again, he was a blue-collar guy. Calls his dad up on the phone and said, Dad, they want $75,000 out here to put a deck on the backside of a house. His father goes, don't you pay them. They're ripping you off. Oh, don't you, you buy me a plane ticket. You, I, he was retired. He said, you fly me out there. You and me, we'll do it. And he said, yeah, we'll do it. So he took a week off work. He, he flew his dad out. They went down to, to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever and got all the parts. You know how much all of the parts for the deck were? A little over $3,000. So they took the next six days to build the deck that they wanted on the back of the house. It did cost him a case of beer because his father said that he doesn't you know, work without cold beer. And so there, people laughed first service. So I don't know what's wrong with you about that. <laughs> so, so, so but they got the whole thing put in. It was like 3300 bucks for a $75,000 deck. Is it right to rip off rich people? No, nor is it right to rip off poor people. Final thing is that I really think it's incumbent on us to make a path for others so that, that we don't just experience God's blessings. We make it possible for others to experience God's blessings. So what I, I love about what Hubert's doing, just consider this. How is the kingdom of God funded? It's funded through the donations of God's people. How do God's people have funds to sow into the kingdom? They learn to live according to God's financial plan. They learn to, 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 to follow the word of God and live in the blessings that God has. What happens to the kingdom of God if a generation does not teach the next generation how to live according to the stewardship principles of God's word? That generation stops funding the kingdom of God until somebody comes in and brings a fresh revelation. I mean, think about that. If, if we have a kingdom obligation to make sure that, that, that whatever truths we have discovered that allow us to live in, in a blessed place are not just with us, that, that we pass those on. We have a kingdom responsibility to make pathways for people to, to experience transformation for themselves. There's an amazing story out of, out of Denny's. You guys know Denny's? Anybody ever eat at Denny's? Of course you all have. Don't be lying to me. Raise your hand. Seriously, how many people have ever eaten at a Denny's? All right. It says, you guys are off. Oh, no, we only go to the, you know, to the brunch place on, you know, whatever. Everybody's eating at a Denny's, man. Come on. $2.99 back in the day for pancakes and eggs, man. It's all good. So Denny's had a plan, or maybe still have a plan, to, to help empower women to become owners of Denny's franchises because they had a real shortage of that. And one of the, the success stories that I love is there was a woman uh, who was a 30-something-year-old single mother who was the, the, the manager or the assistant manager of a Denny's in Texas. And the company went to her and said, hey, how would you like to own a Denny's? And she said, I'd love to own a Denny's, but I've got no money. I mean, I can't do that. She so said, don't you worry about it. We'll, we'll loan you the money and empower you and give you the training to be a Denny's owner. So she took the step. She worked really, really hard, became one of the most successful Denny's owners in all of the state of Texas. They came to her a few years later and said, you know, you're doing really well with that one store you got, but there's a store just down the street that's failing. Would you like to take over that store? Because what will help you buy that store as well. Oh, sure, I'll take over that store. She takes over, took over that store. So, so what happened was there were all these Denny's, because you used to see Denny's everywhere that weren't doing well and they were failing. But her Denny's were succeeding because she worked hard and, and made it a priority. And so she started taking over failing Denny's after failing Denny's after failing Denny's. And about five years ago, I read this story. At that time, do you want to know how many Denny's she owned? Eighty. Eighty. That's a good story. That's, that's to me, is somebody who said, you know something? We can change the storyline of somebody's life. And she's inspired countless other women to believe that they could be an owner as well. We need to be inspiring people that God working in your life can bring about transformation, and you can do this even if everything is against you.
couple of final things that I want to say is, and this was funny, I was sharing these notes with a buddy of mine who's a financial planner. And I said, the other thing to reduce risk is to understand the importance of diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Have multiple streams of income. Uh, Ecclesiastes 11, 1 and 2 says, spend your grain across the seas and in time, profits will flow back to you. But divide your investments among many places for you don't know which, what risks might lie ahead. He's a Christian. He said, you know, I've been teaching my, my clients that for decades. It never occurred to me that it was in the Bible. <laughs> I said, a lot of good advice is in the Bible. And finally, don't try to approach tomorrow with yesterday's skills. If, if you'll do that, if you will do that, you will begin to see yourself become a lifetime learner, and you'll mitigate the risks, and you'll handle change because change is coming. So we've seen the, the need for hard work. We've seen the need for, for really wanting to just do it scared, as Joyce Meyer says. You know, do it scared. You know, sometimes following God, it's not risky. It's just scary. You, you know what I'm saying? Because it's unknown. But you can also mitigate the risks by, by following the principles of God's word. And, and the last thing is to pray for vision and guidance. Did you know that God made people different? Wow, somebody should say, that's just blowing my head. Did, do you know not everybody's supposed to be a business owner? Did you know that not everybody's supposed to work for uh, Google and make $300,000 a year? Did you know God calls some people to be teachers in low-income neighborhoods? Did you know that God sometimes calls people to, 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 to not go to college? So there are different paths to biblical prosperity. I shared with you, I've known janitors who prospered. I, I've known women who never finished high school who've prospered. But the deal is, what is your plan? What's the plan God has given you? Now, Hubers was to revise his family business. He, he seized an opportunity, took advantage of it, worked hard at it, sought God. It's grown. I have another friend. He literally, he inherited a third, he was the third generation to take over this business in his hometown. Took over business. His father, his grandfather started it. His father inherited it from his from grandfather. He inherited it from his father. And, and, and they were sitting there and they go, well, well, well it's just, it seems to be struggling. It's struggling because the town is dying. He relocated it to a bigger town that was nearby, and the thing exploded tenfold. His plan was not to do what his father had done. His plan was not to do what his grandfather had done. His plan was to hear the voice of God, which led him into a new opportunity. I have a family member who, who inherited a business that had been, uh, it, was, it was a small, successful family business. But it was 80% service and 20% sales, which means that they mainly did things for people. You'd call them up, and one of their techs would go out and work for you, and, and they would bill by the hour. They would bill so many dollars per hour. So, you know, it, it, Brandon, they'd take you and, and try to bill out a 1,000 hours a year or whatever for every employee. And so they, th that's how they got their money, was, was taking technicians and having them go and do stuff. And then they sold equipment kind of to promote the service side of the business. Well, when this, this individual inherited this business, he, you know, he took a look at it and said, you know, do you know what the profit margins are on our equipment sales? Way higher than on our service calls. Do you know how many hours you can sell of an employee's time? In a great year, about 2,000, usually about 1,500. Do you know how many limits are on the equipment we sell? None. We can sell as many as we want to. And so he took five years and moved the company from being 80% service and 20% sales to 80% sales and 20% service. Their revenue went up fivefold, and their profit margins doubled on a percentage basis. Risky? I don't think so. Would you like to know my personal financial plan? that the Holy Spirit revealed to me in the business class lounge of American Airlines in Chicago O'Hare Airport in about 1991? Would you like to hear this? Do you know what prompted this great epiphany and revelation from God? I'd invested in some stocks in the stock market, and they tanked. I lost everything, and I was mad at God. 
And I was, I, was in the, I was going to Dublin, Ireland to work with some Irish engineers, and I was just telling God how screwed up he was and how messed up he was and how he lied to me and how I didn't get my fair share because I'd been a good tither and a good sower, and I'd, I had a plan, and I was going to be a stock picker, and I was going to be a success. And God, I invested in that. I prayed about it, and I bought it, and you, God, I lost everything. I lost everything in those stocks. You did not follow through. And there was a pause, and God said, Reese, when did I tell you to become a stock picker? And I said, I don't recall, but that was my dream. Yeah, that was your dream. That wasn't my dream for you. Do you want to know what your personal financial plan is going to look like? It's got three steps. The first is serve. I want you to be the best employee your company has ever seen. The best that you can possibly be. You may not be the best there, but you need to be the best employee they've got. You need to be valuable to them. You need to make them a priority. You need to help them to prosper and thrive. And that's whatever career you get into. You need to be a good employee, so you need to serve. Okay, I can do that. I'd rather own. You're never going to own. You're going to serve. Your whole life is going to be spent serving and solving problems because you were built to solve problems. And I am. I'm good at solving problems. I do it well. It's a God-given gift. So you're going to serve and you're going to solve. Then you know what you're going to do? You're going to sow. You're going to give. You're going to be generous. I want you to live a life of generosity. Always remember I'm calling you to be generous. Whenever you have an opportunity to give, I want you to remember in the back of your mind that you're called to be generous. That's how I've made you. So you serve, you sow, and you save. I want you to live a lifestyle that will allow you to put money away for the future. Because that's how I'm going to prosper you, little by little, line upon line. It's going to increase. You're probably never going to have billions of dollars flowing through your hand. But that's your financial plan. And I can tell you, how many years is that? 30-something since then? It works. What is your plan. What is God calling you to do? I don't know. Then whatever it is you're doing, do it with all your heart. But keep seeking until the Lord opens up the door. He may be working on your character. I'm not pointing fingers or judging, but if you're a crummy employee, he wants you to figure out how to be a good employee. Because you're not going to work for yourself and be a lazy slacker and have any prosperity. Can I get an amen in this house? If your character is compromised, particularly as it relates to finances, you need to fix that, man. Liars and cheats do not thrive long term. Except maybe in politics. Sorry. I I, I had to say it. It was bad. I'm sorry. Hit me with a head. You know, it's just, it's just, that's not how God calls us to live. Judgment begins with the house of the Lord. But be open. Just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. A couple of things I felt the Holy Spirit prompted me to pray for at the end of this message. And the first is this. Has anybody ever made a dumb decision that you're still paying off? It might be financially, it might be relationally. You know, you, you just made a dumb decision. You're still paying, you're still paying for that. Okay. Welcome to humanity. We're going to pray for that. Has anybody ever pursued something you thought was God and it just didn't work out? Yeah. Welcome to humanity. Has anybody ever felt that God might want to bless other people, but he must not want to bless me? Every eye closed. Apparently I missed that. Apparently I missed that. I don't know what happened. for those who are online and in person. Father, everybody's got baggage. We got junk in the trunk. We got stuff that's been, been holding over our head. It might be debt. It might be past failures. It might be consequences of, of poor decisions that we're still trying to deal with. But God, you bring grace into those situations. There is no stupid that is beyond your grace. There is no stupid that is beyond your grace. There's new beginnings and new, new, new potentials. 
Father, there, there is a, a lie that the enemy perpetrates that says that, that you're disqualified from the blessings of God because the becauses are, are, are infinite, it, because of your ethnicity, because of your family, because of your past, because of your education, because of whatever. There's lies all over the place, God, and they're lies. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just pour your heart into people so they know how beautiful and amazing they are and that no matter what has happened, Father, I, I pray for healing from, from those times when we really thought we were following you and it just didn't work out. For whatever reason, we may never understand why it didn't work. But never let those, God, be a stumbling block to prevent us from continually to passionately pursue you. Give us our plan, Father. Give us our plan. Give us our outline for how you want us to live our lives. In Jesus' name. With every eye closed and every head bowed, I, I just also wish to extend an invitation to anyone who, as we were talking, you realize that there's, there's something wrong in your relationship with God. You, you, there's something that you need to, to just repent of and turn away from. And, it, and it's, it's a stumbling block. You know it's not right, but it's just it's something that you just struggle with. And, and there's some others in this house that, that you honestly have never had a, a, a relationship with God. You've heard about God, maybe attended church some or maybe for a long time, but you just, you realize that praying and following and all this stuff seems so ethereal. You're not sure how to make it personal because your relationship isn't what God wants it to be. I want to encourage you that this morning you can turn that around. All it takes is one decision. One decision. One decision. So I'd like to ask us all to, to pray this prayer. Say, Dear Heavenly Father. Let's all say it together again. Dear Heavenly Father, you know me. You know I'm sorry. I've done some things wrong. I ask for your mercy. But I ask for a future, God. A future with you. path.